Specifically, we are going to talk about quadratic discriminant functions and see how those are working. So to remind you, um, in a previous lecture, we discussed linear discriminant functions. Linear discriminant functions. Discriminant functions. And in linear discriminant functions and analysis, the key assumption was sigma was fixed for all categories. So if you want to relax this assumption, we can end up with uh, other forms of discriminant analysis, like quadratic discriminant analysis. Um, so, so when we have different variance covariance matrix, then we are relax for different groups, then we are relaxing it. So for, if we have a normal distribution with different sigma k's, that means for each group, the discriminant uh, matrix is different from the other one, then we are going to work with quadratic discriminant analysis. So to remind you, sigma is matrix of variance covariance. So let's say we have males and females, And for, for each person, we have weight and height. Weight and height. And so for females, so let's put W and H, W and H. So let's say the, the, the variance, oh, so whatever you put here is the variance of that attribute. For example, if I just write 2 here, 2 is the variance of weight for males. Uh, let's let me write um, 0.25. That will be variance of height for males, and whatever I put here is covariance. Covariance of weight and height is high, so it's perhaps very close to one. So that will be the covariance of weight and height. So let's say females have a different uh, variance covariance. Let's say its weight is one, height is 0.5, and the covariance matrix is 0.8. So sigma of male, which is this one, is different from sigma for females. So that means we, we no longer have the same sigma for both categories. You see that? So that is, that is a covariance variance matrix for males. This is covariance matrix for females. And as you can see here, they're no longer the same. So if we just allow uh, this case to be here, then we are dealing with quadratic discriminant analysis. Um, one of the problems here, okay, so for if we have two people, so if we have two groups and two objects, we only need to estimate three parameters. You see that we just need to estimate what is sigma hat 2 for weight and male, sigma hat of weight female which is covariance of, say, female for male. So let me write it, covariance of weight and uh, height for males. We also need to find covariance of uh, the variance for height for males. So there are three parameters we have to estimate for males, and we need to estimate three parameters for females as well. Same thing. Uh, weight and female, covariance of, for females, covariance of height and weight, and also variance of height. So there are six parameters need to be estimated, three for each category. But let's say instead of two by two matrix, we had 10 attributes. You had weight, height, and so many other things. For example, income, um, credit cards, and X10, let's say zip code. Let's, uh, let's uh, use another. So the temperature, the, the average temperature for zip code, and same thing here. Then as you can see, the number of variables we need to estimate for each category is, is so large. We have 10 variable, 10 things to be estimated, which are the variances of these 10 variables. And then we have 9 times 9, 81 more variables to be estimated. So for each group, we needed to find 
around 100, around, sorry, uh, that is 9 by 9 divided, okay, so that is, uh, that, uh, so 9 here, 9 down, so 9 times, nine. okay, we have 40, f around, around 50 of, uh, 50, we have 45 variables to be estimated here, 10 here, so we, we need to estimate 55 variables. Why 55? Because covariances are the same. Covariance of weight and height is the same as weight and height. So anything, if you just estimate top part of diagonal, you're fine. So basically, we need to estimate 55 parameters just for females, 55 for males. If you had, let's say, 100 variables, they become even worse. We had to estimate 9,000, some, somewhere around 9,000. Uh, for 4,500 maybe, slightly more maybe, yeah. Around 5,000, yeah. Sli around 5,000 parameters for females and men. And let's say you only have 50 observations, 200 observations, so it's impossible. When you have a lot of, uh, lot of attributes for each group, then you use something called naive base. In naive base, you assume that um, the, the covariance matrix is has only have diagonal elements and everything else is zero so there is no covariance it's a very strong assumption but in in practice it has been shown that it's a very good assumption because first of all if you have a lot of attributes it's impossible to estimate all covariances second of all um, it's computationally extensive even if you can do it uh, because you lose a lot of degrees of freedom when you deal with these many covariances it's easily you may easily uh, overfit your data. So, so that's not so bad. So if you, just for each category, which is not males or females in this example, you only stick to estimating the, co uh, the variances of each variable and assume the covariances are all zero, you're dealing with naive base. And this is particularly um, interesting when you have sigma k diagonal. A diagonal uh, when you have a lot of attributes like p and that makes sigma k diagonal that means for attributes you have independent observation that's why the conditional independence will happen so you only need to just multi to get the likelihood function you just need to multi multiply the um, density function we, we can also use other density models which are non-parametric which is beyond the scope of this course so by just relaxing the assumption of uh, constant variance and covariance for all groups, we will be dealt with quadratic discriminant functions. There we, we, we let our groups have different variances. So here we have this orangish group and this uh, bluish, bluish one. Here we, we let x2 has a different, sorry, we, we let orange group has a different um, sigma orange than the sigma which was the variance covariance matrix for blue curve. And if you do that you can show that the discriminant scores will be a function of the inverse of this matrix and here we have 1x here and 1x here so x squared will appear in this in this function and that's why they look like quadratic. So the, the, the discriminant functions we have will, so in one variable case, would look like a function on x2 and x, so that they're quadratic. If you're dealing with two variables, then you have x12, x22, and x1, x2, and x1 and x2. So by, 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 by assuming that you allow these a sigma k is b there, which is different uh, covariances matrices for, for each group, then you let the boundary become nonlinear. So here you can see what was the discriminant linear discriminant uh, boundary for, for, for same simulation and that will be linear. So here um, the actual, so on, on left graph, the actual um, 
the actual simulated data had the same variance, so it was actually linear. So as you can see, what we estimate, which is this dashed one on linear discriminant analysis, did a better job in comparison to this group, green one, which was based on quadratic uh, assumptions. So if, if indeed your groups are linearly separated, it's better not to use quadratic um, discriminant analysis. And in the right panel, the, there is actual differences between these groups and their variance. So, so the actual discriminant boundary is this um, dashed one, uh, pink dashed one. That's the actual boundary. If you use linear discriminant analysis, you get this black dashed one, which is not terribly good. But if you use quadratic discriminant function, as you can see, it follows the, um, it pretty much looks like the same as what it should have been. So depending on whether or not your underlying assumption is linear or quadratic, you may use linear or quadratic. And the way we can test it is through te using test data. So in naive Bayes, you're assuming that your sigma case are, are, uh, are diagonal. That means you only have variances, no covariances. And it's easy to show that you can just write down your quadratic, your discriminant scores as functions on each variable. So if you have p variables, if you have p variables, the discriminant score will be mi minus 1 over 2. Sigma 1 minus mu k1, which uh, divided by sigma 2k1 plus x2 minus mu k2 divided by sigma 2k2 and so on and so forth. So let's say we have heights and weights and we have sigma 2 of height for males and sigma 2 for weight for males. So gamma male of delta male of get x is Actually, we have two variables, so it's x1 and x2. So it will be minus 1 over 2, x1 minus mu of males for 1, which was uh, height divided by sigma 2 height male squared, plus uh, negative 1 over 2, x2 minus mu of male for weight squared, divided by sigma 2 of um, weight and male plus log of pi of male, so prior probability for males. So that is very interesting um, and has a very easy format as you can see. So naive Bayes are, have very extremely, uh, have extremely easy representation and that's why they're used all over the place, specifically when you have a large number of features. Here I gave you an example that Males and females will have two features, and the variance within them were different. And it's not too hard to show that when you use LDAs, um, you actually can show that the log of odds will become linear. And I think it does ring a bell, and the, 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 the bell that was rank is about logistic regression. So they have the same format, in a sense. Uh, the only difference is logistic regressions use conditional likelihood functions, whereas LDAs use generative linear functions. So instead of using y condition on x, you use the probability of x and y simultaneously. So gen generalized linear, uh, generative uh, learning functions, likelihood functions. So despite the differences in the the practice, if you just use them in practice, they almost do the same thing unless you're dealing with some, some very explicit, uh, very exceptional cases. And if you use QDA, QDA, and you can show that QDAs and logistic regression that use quadratic terms are also very similar in most of the applications. But when did we use logistic regression versus LDAs and QDAs? Logistic, logistic regressions are very good uh, models when you have two classes, because they're extremely interpretable. 
LDAs are useful when either your number of observations are small or the classes are well separated and as we explained earlier if here are classes they're very well separated logistic regression does a terrible job or when we have more than um, two classes so if any of these quest, uh, assumptions hold and if they follow the Gaussian uh, distributions if these assumptions all use LDA naive Bayes which assume um, your matrix of uh, variance covariance matrix was diagonal can be used when P is large that means we have a lot of observations so if you have high level observations uh, high level of uh, features in your observations high level of variables then uh, naive base is very useful that means uh, that assumes may okay is diagonal that means variances are there but covariances are not and here is the end of our lecture in chapter four i hope you enjoyed that uh, we will continuing uh, continue and work on our sessions in chapter four and you will have videos on that as well thank you very much